Welcome to Hot and Trocken. My name is Dirk Schieborn and in this video I want to talk about differentiation rules. In particular the sum rule, the product rule and the quotient rule. In our last videos we have defined the derivative of a function f at a point a to be the so-called differential quotient which is the limit of slopes of a sequence of so-called secants. So the limit of the sequence of these slopes is called differential quotient. Calculating the differential quotient, or in other words the derivative of f at a, is all about calculating limits of sequences. We have used this technique, for example, to find a very important rule for differentiation, the so-called power rule. In this video we want to use the technique of the differential quotient to find the derivative of sums, products and quotients of two given functions for which we already know the derivatives. So let's suppose we are given two differentiable functions f and g, where differentiable in this moment only means that they have a derivative. What we want to discuss in this video is, what if we build a new function, which we call capital F, which is the sum of f and g. Is there a simple way to find the derivative of capital F, provided that we already know the derivatives of f and g? And we do not only want to answer this question for f plus g, but also for f minus g, for f times g, and for f divided by g. We will call the respective rules we are going to find the sum rule, the product rule and the quotient rule. Let us start with the sum rule. In fact, the sum rule is as simple as it can be, namely the derivative of capital F is given as the sum of the derivative of F plus the derivative of G. Before we prove it, we want to verify the sum rule at a graphical example. Let us look at these two functions F and G. We then build a third function, which we call capital F, as the sum of F and G. We now want to understand what the derivative of capital F is at some given point A. So we fix some point A. The derivative of the function capital F at point A is given as the slope of the tangent to F at the point A. We can illustrate the tangent and its slope by drawing the slope triangle to the function capital F at the point A. For this position of A we obtain a slope or a derivative of 0 0.75. Next we do the same for F and G at the point A. So the respective derivatives at the point A are F prime of A equals 0 0.95 and g prime of a equals negative 0.19. Now according to the sum rule, the derivative of capital F at a should be the sum of the derivative of f at a and the derivative of g at a. This is indeed the case. We can verify this 0 0.95 minus 0 0.19. Well, ignoring rounding errors, we get 0 0.75. And this relation is valid no matter which value for a we choose. So if I change the value for a, the relation will remain valid. So for instance, one interesting value is a equals 1. Here the derivative of g is perfectly 0. The derivative of f is 0 0.8 and we get the derivative of 0 0.8 plus 0 for the function capital F. Now we want to prove the sum rule in a formal way using the differential quotient. So we start with lim h to 0 capital F of x plus h minus capital F of x divided by h. And we now replace capital F by f plus g. We get lim h to 0 f x plus h plus g x plus h minus f of x and now minus g of x divided by h. So the next thing is that we simply rearrange the terms in the numerator. So we get lim h to 0 f x plus h and now I write minus f of x and then g x plus h and now minus g of x 
and you see already what happens, divided by h. And now I can split up the fraction by doing the following, lim h to zero, fx plus h minus fx minus fx divided by h plus lim h to zero g x plus h minus g of x over h. Well, now we have two differential quotients, one for f, which is f prime of x, and the other one for g, which is g prime of x. And there we go. We have proven the sum rule. Now, in a very similar way, we can show that a very similar rule holds for the difference of functions. So if capital X is the difference of f and g, the derivative of capital F is the difference of the derivative of F and the derivative of G. Next, we want to discuss the more interesting situation when capital F is given as the multiplication or the product of F and G. The rule for determining the derivative of capital F is called the product rule. In fact, the product rule is also built upon the derivatives of F and G which are, however, multiplied by the function value of the respective other function. These expressions then are summed up. If we phrase this in natural language, we get the derivative of the product of f and g at x is given by the derivative of f at x times the function value of g at x plus the function value of f at x times the derivative of g at x. Let us now try to verify the product rule with a graphical example. We start with these two functions f of x and g of x and build a third function capital F of x which is the product of f and g. It is fruitful to take some time and verify that the yellow curve really is the product of the blue and the orange curve. The starting point is to verify that the yellow curve is zero whenever either g or f is zero. We have the situation here where g is zero, the situation here where f is zero, here g is zero, here f is zero, here g is zero. The yellow function capital F is always positive when either f and g are both positive or both negative. For instance, in this area, capital F is positive the reason for this is that both the blue function f and the orange function g are negative. Negative times negative is positive. In this area, capital F is negative. The reason for this is that we have mixed signs for f and g. f is negative, whereas g is positive. In the next step, we again fix some point a on the x-axis, where we want to calculate the derivative of capital F. In this case, we fix a equals negative 1. Again, the derivative of capital F can be illustrated by the slope triangle. The slope triangle shows that the derivative of capital F at a equals negative 0.67. Now we also draw the slope triangles for F and G and look at their derivatives. We find that the derivative of F at a equals negative 0.48 and that the derivative of g at a equals 0.56. Now, as we want to understand the product rule, we also need the function values for f and g at the point a. The function value of f at a is negative 1.89 and the function value of g at a is negative 0.83. Now let's try to throw all together and verify the product rule. Recall the product rule has this structure and if we replace these values by the values we have found, we indeed get the slope of capital F, which is negative 0.67. Watch that we have all these values found before. So for instance, for the derivative of F at A, which is negative 0.48, we have the derivative of F at A, negative 0.48. So for this point and these functions, the product rule has been verified. We can now let the point A move along the x-axis in order to verify that the product rule also is valid for other positions of A. And if you for instance take this point where the blue function f is zero, 
The formula simplifies to minus 2 times minus 0 0.6, which is the slope of the blue curve here, which is negative 2, multiplied with the value of the orange curve, which is negative 0.6. So altogether we have positive 1.2 as the derivative of capital F, and that fits with the visual impression we have here for the yellow curve, slope of 1.2. Let us now prove the product rule using the differential quotient. So we start with lim h to 0 f x plus h minus f of x divided by h, which is, if we replace capital F by the definition, that means the product of f and g, we get f of x plus h times g of x plus h minus f of x times g of x divided by h. Now we use a little trick to modify the numerator. We subtract an extra expression, which we immediately add again. So actually nothing happened. I'll show you what I mean. We have lim h to 0 fx plus h times gx plus h. And now I subtract f of x times g of x plus h. That is the new expression I am subtracting and which I immediately add again, so actually nothing happened. So I add this expression again. And we then continue fx times g of x divided by h. Now the next trick is to split the numerator into two parts, this one and this one. At the same time, we factor out the common factor in the first part, which is this one, and we factor out the common factor in the second part, which is this one. Doing this, we all together get gx plus h, which we write in front of the fraction, and the fraction fx plus h minus f of x. You see, that will be a differential quotient, divided by h, plus lim h to 0 f of x, which we again write in front of the fraction, and what remains in the fraction is g of x plus h minus g of x, that will be another differential quotient, divided by h. Now let's see what the different limits are. The limit of this expression is g of x, because h is a zero sequence. The limit of this, well, that is just the derivative of f at x, because it's the differential quotient. The limit of this, well, it's a constant sequence, which doesn't contain any h, so that is f of x, and there's another differential quotient, so that is, so this limit is the derivative of g at x. And we have recovered the product rule, because if I now collect everything, we have g of x times f dash of x plus f of x times g dash of x. There we go. The last differentiation rule we're going to talk about in this video is the so-called quotient rule. We use it when we have a new function, capital F, which is given as the division of F by G. The quotient rule has this form. The numerator is the derivative of F times G minus F times the derivative of G, and the denominator is G squared. I point out that we have left away the argument X for reasons of clarity. It is important that we must not confuse the position of derivative and the value in the numerator. So because the function is f divided by g, we need to start with f dash times g, we need to start with f dash times g, and then subtract from it f times g dash. Unfortunately, this quotient rule doesn't get any more transparent when we look at a graphical illustration. This is why we don't do any graphical illustration here. Also, the formal proof uses similar techniques as does the proof for the product rule. So I won't present any formal proof either. Let's rather do some examples instead. We want to find the first derivative of the function fx equals x squared over 1 minus x squared. We use the quotient rule. Following the pattern of the quotient rule, we have f dash of x equals and now it is common to use u and v to denote the numerator and the denominator respectively, because we can't use f and g, because f is already used. So the quotient rule has the formal form u dash v minus v dash u divided by v squared. So we first calculate the two derivatives, so that is u 
dash equals 2x and v dash equals minus 2x. If we bring this all together, we have 2x times 1 minus x squared minus minus 2x times x squared divided by 1 minus x squared squared. We will now simplify this by expanding the brackets in the numerator. So that is 2x minus 2x to the third power plus 2x to the third power divided by, well, still the same denominator, 1 minus x squared squared. And we leave that denominator, we don't expand the brackets here. Now you see that we can considerably simplify the numerator because we have minus 2x to the third power plus 2x to the third power. So what altogether remains is 2x over 1 minus x squared squared. And there is no possibility for any further simplifications. So that is the final result. Now it's interesting to realize that for finding the derivative of that rather complex function, we have only used the quotient rule and the power rule. In particular, we haven't made use of any differential quotient and of any limit calculations at all. These are all hidden behind these rules. So because we have found the rules in a general way, we don't have to bother with limit calculations or differential quotients anymore. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.